right? And so we're going we're gonna to dive into the scripture this morning. Philippians chapter 1 is where we will be. So if you have your Bible, turn on it over to there. And as you're turning, just a couple more announcements. Um, just like Donnie said, the, the youth are going on a mission trip next Saturday. So if you have a child, um, or excuse me, they don't like to be referred to as children. If you have a teenager who is in grades 6 through 12, we would love to have them. Uh, so come see me after church or text me this week. Um, $10 a person. We're going to Covington, serving at the Moore Activity Center, which is a children's outreach facility there in Covington, right on the outskirts of Cincinnati. Speaking of, like, Wednesday night stuff, there is no Wednesday night this Wednesday as well. We didn't get that in the bullet. Well, it's on the back. We just didn't announce it. So there are no Wednesday nights this coming Wednesday. And then the last announcement I have, as I promise, is that on October 22nd, we are taking our children to what is called Children's Day Camp at Valley Creek Baptist Church. It is so much fun. If you've gone in the past, your child um, has probably had a blast. It's for children in third through fifth grade, and it'll be an all-day event. So see me to sign up if you have a child in third through fifth grade. I would love to take them. It's going to be so much fun. All right, let's get into it this morning. So in Philippians is where we're going to be this morning, and the title of the sermon is What Do You Treasure? All right, what do you treasure? As we work through this passage and this letter of Philippians, we're seeing that Paul sees all of his life consumed and centered around the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is, I mean, it's a great thing, right? And so all of his life is centered on, sustained by, and empowered by his relationship with Christ. He gets it through everything, right? He's driven by a passion to know Christ and to make Christ known, no matter what the cost, right? And so today, we are going to see, we're going to look at that despite his circumstances, Paul is still full of joy because he treasures Christ above all else. And from this reservoir of joy flows love and selfless living for the good of others. And now I have to watch you some fancy words. Sydney Bright told me this morning that she was not looking forward to sitting in here because she was going to be bored. Because I teach at a high level when I talk to you all. So i got to bring it down, okay? So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna use simple words this morning. That's okay. i got to make sure my children feel welcome in here, right? And so... This morning, we're going to look at uh, just a couple points about how treasuring Christ is what gives Paul joy in life to serve others selflessly. And so, first point this morning is we're going to go ahead and throw it up there on the screen. Christ can give joy and contentment despite our circumstances. And so we're going to read this passage now. As you write, fill in that point, listen as we read this passage. Philippians chapter 1, we're going to start in 18, and I'm going to read on down through 26. So you can follow along with me. It says this, it says, What does it matter? Only that in every way, whether from, from false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice, yes, and I will continue to rejoice, because I know that this will lead to my salvation through your prayers and help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. My eager expectation is, and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but that now as always, with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Now, if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me. And I don't know which one I should choose. I am torn between the two. I long to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Since I am persuaded of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that, because of my coming to you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus may abound. Let's pray as we get started. God, thank you so much just for the opportunity to just be here this morning and worship your name. Father, Lord, this morning, um, we do remember those who can't worship you this morning. God, we're, we, we're thinking of those in Florida whose church might have got destroyed, Father, in the hurricane, so be with them, Father. But Lord, help us to know that a church is just not a building, Father, Lord, and that we worship your name. And so, Father, I pray as we dive into your word, God, that you would be honored, you would be glorified, and that people would come to know you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so the first point this morning is that Christ can give joy and contentment despite our circumstances. Now, if you think about it, it's really easy to get caught up in stuff in life that doesn't really matter, right? If you think about it, the biggest thing in my head, and this is almost sounding like I'm coming, something that it doesn't matter to me, but it does, is sports, right? We all get caught up in sports, if you follow sports anyway. If you have a passionate team, it's really easy to get caught up in that, in that if your team wins or loses, it'll either make or break your day, right? I mean, just ask any UK football fan. I'm sure they're feeling it today, right? Of the big loss that they had yesterday, I apologize to all my 
UK football people. That's not me, okay? My team got a big win over, and I'm just saying that in front of my three Auburn fans that are in here today. So my LSU Tigers got the big win yesterday. I, I wasn't going to gloat. I didn't wear my LSU shirt, but I do have my LSU socks on today. Dixon, that's for you. And so it's really easy to get caught up and let stuff steal our joy that doesn't matter, right? Whether it's sports, whether it's other stuff, right, that we're interested in. And so sometimes we just go through life and we get so upset over the stuff and it causes us to really be discontented with our life, right? And so what does that mean to be content in any situation? Like when we said that Christ can give joy and contentment, well, what does that mean to even be content? And is that even possible? Well, according to Google, contentment is a state of happiness and satisfaction. That's simply what Google says. And so I believe that it is important to live a life of contentment, especially as a Christian. Especially as a Christian, we should be learning to be content in any situation, and that begins with understanding the difference between being happy and being content. You know that I can be happy and not be content, and then vice versa. I can be content and not be happy, because happiness is an emotion, and unlike contentment, which is a state of being. You can be happy today and unhappy tomorrow. It comes and goes. I mean, we all have those days, right, where we wake up and we're just in a bad mood for absolutely no reason. Or at least I do. I, maybe I'm just the only one. But some days I wake up and I'm just in a terrible mood for absolutely no reason. And maybe you're like that. But when we learn to be content, we are essentially learning to give all of our problems and our worries over to God and we leave them there. Basically letting go and letting God do his thing. And if we think about the guy who was writing this letter, Paul obviously had no easy life. If you've been in church for any amount of time, you know that Paul was one of the greatest missionaries of all time. But at times he was on the run from people who wanted to kill him. And he sometimes found himself writing letters to believers from the comfort of prison cells. That is exactly where we are found right now in Philippians. And so furthermore, he was often without food and he traveled from place to place preaching the gospel under basically the dangers of being killed, beaten, whatever. And that's why you see in all of his letters how thankful, though, he is for whatever church he's writing that letter to in that moment. For today, it's the Philippians. You know, at the beginning, we didn't read it, but he's saying how thankful he was um, to Paul and Timothy and the church of, of Philippi, right? And so that's what he is talking about. But so how does Paul manage to have that attitude? Because I go through my day, and I get upset when the McDonald's worker messes my order up, right? But yet you see Paul, who literally was in prison, but yet was happy, was contented with his life. Well, he gives us the answer later on down um, in verse, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 19. He says, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ. And so Paul, throughout this whole book of Philippians, is talking about why he's thankful for God despite his circumstances. And so when we become discontented, it usually develops from a place of want or desire, right? We become unhappy with our current situation and we look around for something that is better, right? Maybe your example is that I'm discontented with my marriage because I want my husband to be better. I'm discontented with my marriage because I want my wife to be a better cook. I want my wife to not spend so much money, right? I, I'm discontented with my church because there aren't enough lively activities or the music is not like a big smoke show, right? Or Donnie just doesn't preach the right with the way I like it, right? We, or I don't like Austin because he's just so whatever. I don't know. There's nothing wrong with me, right? I don't know. Um, I can't even think of an example. Jeez, I'm the most humble person I know, right? I'm not saying that we shouldn't strive for greatness. I want you to love your marriage, obviously. I want you to love your, your church. If it's not this church, I want you to love a church, wherever you choose to go. I want you to love your job, wherever it is. You should be happy. I'm not saying we shouldn't strive for greatness and betterment. However, there is a difference between understanding that your current situation is not your permanent position and that just being a grump about everything, contentment is a choice. And so I've been challenged by the fact that Paul here is so full of joy in spite of his circumstances that he is joyful in spite of prison. He's also joyful in spite of the actions of others. When others preach Christ as a way to create problems for Paul, his response is simply, in this I rejoice because Christ is exalted. Christ is preached. Paul is joyful while facing death. He is in prison, awaiting a trial, not knowing if he will live or die, but he's still joyful. And in Scripture, we find that God himself is our joy. It cannot be taken away from us. It cannot be stolen from you by anyone. And the joy we experience here is just a foretaste of heaven. 
And so the sub-point this morning is godly contentment. Godly contentment. Thank you, Gage. There we go. Godly contentment teaches us to be patient and to wait on God's guidance instead of rushing ahead and making things worse. And so in order for us to treasure Christ, to be happy with what he has given us, we must be patient and wait on God's guidance. We have to remember that our current position that we are in is not our final destination. That job that you hate, it, you might hate it today but love it tomorrow. Or maybe you will find a better job one day. God will lead you out of that, right? God can turn your marriage around to make it better. God can make you happy. But it's all according to his will, right? And we have to be happy with God's will. Whatever he plans for our life, right? And so your current position is not your final destination. Second point this morning is this. Joy comes from treasuring Christ. All these points are very similar this morning because I want you to get that one message this morning. Joy comes from treasuring Christ. We see here in verses 19 and 20 it says, Because I know this will lead to my salvation through your prayers and help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. My eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but that now as always, with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul's expectation is that Christ will be honored because to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's literally in the next verse, right, that, that he says in 21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He is making two claims here. First, he is claiming that he expects that he will honor or glorify Christ. And second is that he will live for Christ because to die is to gain, right? The two claims are linked by the word for. I want us to look at the second claim first, though, because it is the reason or the foundation for his claim that he will honor Christ. To live as Christ and to die as gain means that if he lives, he has Christ. And if he dies, it is far better because to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. He's addressing the fears of the Philippians. And he's saying that death is not a thing to fear because being in the presence of Christ is far better. Treasuring Christ is valuing Christ above all else. Death is gained because Paul will be in the presence of Christ. And he longs for that day because he treasures Christ. He had no fear of death because death was gained. Paul wanted to, de to depart, to be with Christ, because he knew that in his presence there will be joy evermore. And that's a difficult statement. You know, we hear that in church all the time of, well, you know, it's good to, to die and be with heaven. You know, it's good to let your loved ones pass on and uh, be out of pain and all that stuff. It, that, that, that's a big, that is a good thing. That's a big statement to make. And it is the truth. But it's not that easy in the moment, is it? It's not that easy when you're seeing your loved one dying and, and you're like, oh, you know, if you pass on, you'll be in, with Christ. Well, it's not that easy for us because we don't understand that as a human, right? It's not easy for us to make the claims that, that you know, we want to die and to, to move on to be with Christ, which is a great thing. But in our head, we can't fathom that, right? Because we've never experienced death. Obviously, if you're here this morning, you've never experienced death. But Paul makes that claim. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To die is gain. Subpoint: point. Treasuring Christ glorifies Christ. Did I uh, pick? Did I skip one? I did, didn't I? Wow. I should have said that. Treasuring Christ is valuing Christ above all else. Let's start there. How about that? My goodness, y'all are getting a full... Just um, Wednesday night Bible study. This is how I roll, you know. All right, treasuring Christ is valuing Christ above all else. We just went through that whole thing right there, yes. Treasuring Christ glorifies Christ. You know, Paul says, It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be ashamed. Paul is obviously not ashamed, and, but he has full courage now. As always, Christ will be honored in his body, whether by life, or death, because like we said in the passage, for him to live is Christ, or for to live is Christ and to die is gain. If Paul lives, he gets to serve Christ, which he's happy to do. He wants to serve him, but to die is to be with Christ. Paul has confidence that he will not, you know, cower or be intimidated, but will experience the Spirit's empowerment to honor Christ by boldly and confidently proclaiming Christ in difficult circumstances, because to live is Christ and to die is gain. 
He had no fear of death because the presence of Christ was so sweet to him. Treasuring Christ like that honors or glorifies Christ. And so are you so secure in God and his truth that he is better than life? The life that you live, is Christ better than that? Are you willing to die for Christ? And are you not afraid of anything that you would honor Christ in your life and death? Treasuring Christ above all else is the key to joy. If you don't treasure Christ, you're not going to have joy. Joy in God comes not merely from intellectual assent to, to correct doctrine. Joy in God comes when we treasure Christ because our hearts are drawn to him. You know, in, a, in relationship and in a friendship way, right? I mean, it's like a marriage vow, okay? Marriage is the legal act. You know, the marriage certificate that you have says that you are legally married, right? But that's not marriage. We know that that's not just what says you're married, right? It's the act of being together. It's the act of living together. It's the act of doing life together and experiencing life and loving that person despite their flaws, right? That's what marriage is. It's not a certificate. And so it's just what makes our relationship with God joyful is the experience of being with Him as well. Just saying you're a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. The same as having a marriage certificate doesn't make you married. In order to have joy in Christ and to treasure Christ, you must spend time with Christ. You must love God. You must want to be with Him. That's why Scripture actually tells us that we are the bride of Christ. If we truly see Christ as our treasure, we will truly treasure, desire, and take pleasure in that relationship with Him. We must not only know about Christ, but we also must want the sweet relationship of knowing Christ. Any marriage that never goes beyond a mere legal documentation is obviously no marriage at all. The reason why Paul had joy in spite of all of his circumstances was his relationship with Christ. He knew that was a constant thing and that Christ would always be there for him. And if you have that kind of joy, no one can take it away from you because God himself is our joy. There is joy found in nothing else besides God. Paul knew from personal experience. He says, in, later on, he says, You will show me the path of life, and your presence is fullness of joys. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Or because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. My soul will be satisfied as with rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. You know, going back to the whole marriage thing, it's kind of the same way for anything in life, right? Um, but specifically marriage, you know, my marriage certificate is not what makes my marriage awesome, right? It's not even that I know Brooklyn is a good wife. It's not that I know that she cooks food and, and, and does whatever, right? And that she loves me and she loves me despite my flaws. It's, it's not all that thing. It's the, simply the, the experience of seeing her do that, right? I mean, you could tell some, I could tell someone all day, right, how awesome of a wife Brooklyn is. But if you saw her treat me otherwise here at church, right, you might think, well, is he lying? I think he might be lying. I don't really know, right? But it's the experience of being together and loving her and her loving me, right? And so it's the same with God. In the same way I know that I'm in Brooklyn's presence because I experience her, I know I'm in God's presence because I experience him. Same goes for almost any experience, right? I mean, think about it. Any experience that you've had in life, you will not understand the true value of it until you've experienced yourself, right? I think about certain things like national parks. I haven't been to many national parks. I've seen, like, pictures of the Grand Canyon, but I've never experienced it in person. People who tell me say that it's really, really cool. I think it looks cool, but I don't know for sure, right? Or think about sports teams. You say you love a certain sports team, but until you've gone and experienced a game, it's hard to understand what level of, you know, just like happiness and joy maybe that can bring you, right? And to be a true fan, so to speak, of that team. Being at the stadium, seeing them play, knowing the players, right? Knowing all about that team and that experience is what helps you to be a better fan and to love that team. Maybe it's something else. You know, another thing for me was you see pictures of, say, third world countries, right? On, on commercials, you say, you know, like feed the starving children and all that stuff. And you see these pictures and you're like, oh, that's really sad, right? Well, I didn't really grasp that until I went to Haiti. Seeing that in person makes it so much more real when I went to Haiti. And you see children who are starving to death, begging for food. You see the dirtiness through the streets. You see the living conditions that they live in and how they live in these little tents with a, held up by a two-by-four, you know? You don't understand it until you experience it. You don't really know what it's like until you have that experience. And the same goes 
with God. Enjoying God is not a secondary, or secondary endeavor, right? It's central to everything that we do. We do not do other things hoping that joy in God will just emerge as a byproduct. That's not going to happen. Our reason for the pursuit of God and obedience to Him is precisely the joy that is found in Him alone. It is desiring the vast ocean deep pleasures that, of God more than the, just the little mud puddle pleasures of wealth, power, or lust that this world can bring you. It is out of this treasure in Christ that joy flows into us. And it is out of this joy that love overflows towards others in selfless living. That brings us to our third point this morning. Treasuring Christ gives us the power to live selflessly. If you read what Paul says down in 22 through 26, he says, Now if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me. And I don't know which one I should choose because I'm torn between the two. I long to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But to remain in the flesh is necessary for your sake. Since I am persuaded of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that because of coming to you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus may abound. Paul's reason for living is for the Philippian church's progress and joy in the faith. He wanted to see them have joy in faith in Jesus. Joy was his motive for selfless living. Nothing else. I mean, think about it. Why would Paul be motivated by going to prison? Why would Paul be motivated by people wanting to beat him up? Why would Paul be motivated to share the gospel with him when people are literally trying to kill him? Right? I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't be very motivated to do something if someone was trying to kill me or beat me up. I would probably second guess that. But Paul was so sure in his relationship with Christ that it was all worth it to him. Every beating that he took, every arrest, every day he starved, in the prisons, it was worth it to him. Joy was central to Paul, and so it was essential to his ministry. In fact, Paul's ministry was motivated by both his own joy and the joy of to those whom he ministered. Joy was not the only motive, but joy was a resource for selfless living, right? The more joy we have, the more likely we're willing to serve people and to want to do other things out of just the joy of our heart. Out of the overflow of joy he found in treasuring Christ, love spilled over into ministry towards the Philippian church like a cup overflowing. Love is the overflow of joy in God that flows towards others in sacrificial serving for their good. I mean, isn't the same way in our lives? When we love something so much that it brings us joy, we usually serve it selflessly, right? We're willing to do extra things for them. I hope one example of this would be your marriage. I hope you love your husband or your wife so much that you're willing to serve them and not expect anything in return, right? Just because she cooks you dinner doesn't mean that she's going to, you know, let you get out of mowing the grass, right? Just because you mow grass doesn't mean that you get to sit and watch football all day, Donnie. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Donnie, don't like, Donnie don't like him sitting in the front row, do you? I call you out quite often. That's all right. I pray, though, that you live, that you live to serve your husband and you love them so much that you want to serve them without expecting anything in return. And the same goes for other stuff too, right? Many of you are this way when it comes to certain organizations. You love a certain sports team so much that you donate money to them. You go serve at their serve days if they have those or maybe other organizations in the community that I don't even know about. I know a lot of you are involved in homemakers and other stuff. The things that we're passionate about, we devote our time to and we devote our selfless giving and serving to, right? But what about Christ? What about Christ, though? Do you serve Christ selflessly? What about the church? Do you serve the church selflessly? Or are you seeking something in return from Him? Just because you come to church doesn't mean that God is going to give you a million dollars, right? Just because you say, oh, that God, well, if I serve in children's ministry, I know you'll bless me with a new truck, right? Trust me, I would have a brand new truck sitting out there if he did, right? Um, but no, that's not the way God works, right? God wants us to serve selflessly. And so that's my question this morning is what about Christ? Do you love Christ so much that you're willing to serve him selflessly and devote your time to serving him? And first of all, to loving him selflessly and then serving him. Because our service comes out of the overflow of our hearts, right? If you are depleted spiritually, you shouldn't be serving anyway. 
You need to fill your own reservoir, your own cup of Christ before you can serve others. And so, are you treasuring Christ this morning? Here's what I know, church, as we get ready to wrap up, is we're only on this earth a short time. We're only on this earth, whether it be 80 years, 90, 100 years, maybe it's as short as 50 or 60, right? We're only on this earth a short time. I get that we need to enjoy life. We do. Go on vacation. Go cheer on your sports teams. Go serve in the community, right? Live life to the fullest. Go see things. Enjoy your family. Those things are great. But make sure you treasure Christ. You know, this world is temporary. Christ is eternal. One day, we're going to leave this old world behind us, and we're going to see him face to face. You know, this world is not our home, as that old song used to say, we're just passing through, right? This world's not our home, we're just passing through. And so one day you're going to stand before Christ, and you're going to give an, a, an account for everything that you've ever done and every decision you've ever made. And so have you made Christ a priority? What are you, what's your answer going to be? When he asks you those questions, are you going to be able to say, is he going to be able to say, you know, well done, good and faithful servant? Or is he going to say, hey, hold up a second, I've got some questions. What about this? What about that? Have you made Christ a priority? But first of all, have you made Christ the Lord of your life? For some of us, maybe this morning, it starts there. Before you can treasure Christ, you can't treasure something you don't have, right? And so for some of us, it starts there. Have you made Jesus Christ, the Lord of your life. You know, I say this verse all the time because it's one of my favorite in Scripture. But simply this, Jesus tells us that he is the only way to the Father, right? John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Have you asked Jesus into your heart? Have you, has you, have you made him Lord of your life? I mean, not just ask him into your heart. That doesn't really save you, right? Have you actually made him the Lord of your life? You know, I preached on that a couple months ago. You know, just saying you're a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. Does your service show that you're a Christian? Does your life show that you're a Christian? Have you actually made him Lord of your life? As Paul would go on later to say in verse 27, are you actually living worthy of the gospel that you proclaim? Are you living that life? And so this morning, maybe that's another section of you saying, hey, Austin, you know, I'm a Christian. I know God. You know, I know Jesus is Lord of my life. But I haven't really been living worthy of that gospel calling that he's put on my life. And so this morning for you, maybe it starts there. Maybe it's saying, God, I'm sorry. I know I've messed up and I want to serve you. And there are ways that you can serve him. There are plenty of ways in this church you can serve him. Ways in your own world that you can serve him. But first, you have to make sure that relationship with him is right before you can serve him. Well, before you should serve him anyway. So this morning, my question is this. Do you have Christ in your heart? And then if you do, do you treasure him? Do you treasure Christ? Are you willing to die for him? Are you willing to serve him selflessly out of your selfless motivations? Let's pray. God, thank you so much just for this morning. God, thank you for just the opportunity to worship your name. Father, Lord, I pray that we would become people more like Paul. God, Lord, first of all, more like you. But God, do we look at the great examples of people like Paul who served you selflessly, Father, who was willing to go to prison for you, willing to die for you, God, willing to do whatever it takes to see your kingdom advance. So, Father, this morning, I pray that we would look to examples like that and shape our lives around it. So, Father, this morning, I pray that if there's anyone in this room who may not know you as their Savior, Father, Lord, that you would burden them, God, convict them right where they are, God, so that they have no choice but to come up here, God, and talk to one of us. God, whether it's me, whether it's Donnie, whether it's someone else, God, we want to show them the way, the truth, and the life that you are. Father, for those of us who are saved this morning, God, I pray that we would evaluate our own hearts. God, Lord, help us to, to, to think about the ways that we're serving you, God. And, and if we are treasuring you, God, help us to make you a priority in our lives. Father, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Cross hands with